Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. And I'm Jim the Knife Newbie Person. And uh, we're just sitting here talking about knives. That's what we do here at the Knife Junkie Podcast. I figured... I do it all the time in my regular life yes, anyway. Yes, he does. <laughs> and uh, I, I figured I may as well talk to people uh, who want to hear about knives right, instead right. of those who just wish I'd shut up and go away. Like your wife? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least she knows I'll cut the onions for her. That's right. So, so Jim, let's let's start this off with a pocket check. What, what are you carrying today? Well, being the knife newbie, I do have a, a, a knife, and it is in my pocket, and it's my famous red Swiss Army knife. <laughs> and that is awesome. Everyone should have a Swiss Army knife. Not only have one, but have something like it in right. their pocket. Right. You're ready for a lot of different things. This is I'm, a, I'm ready to open a lot of boxes and use, and use the toothpick. Yeah. And you got a Phillips screwdriver. That's this right. is a tinker, right. I believe. And uh, yeah, so it's great to have. You can do all sorts of stuff with yeah. that. Even cut, punch leather. Cut a lot of boxes with it. Now, I have a lot more knives on me, but Absolutely. a lot less utility because I don't have a Swiss Army on me. In my front right pocket, I have my beloved Hinderer XM24. Which is a, which is much bigger than my yeah, little Swiss is, Army knife. Yes, it, it dwarfs your little Swiss Army knife. <laughs> now, it, uh, so this is the uh, Warncliffe blade, which is beautiful. It's got this uh, uh, working finish, it's called, on it. And then I have my new and loved GEC14, which I just did an unboxing right. uh, video of. And, and uh, that is a beautiful little knife. And then I always have uh, my cold steel pink broken skull. I don't have it with me today. Oh. But uh, I do have this. I'm pockets do you have a knife of my own making <laughs> goodness all right now that we've gotten that out of the way jim my little poor knife here looks <laughs> looks lonely i'll put it over closer to yours on the table here yeah a little security blanket yeah so jim I, i'm looking at this and i'm seeing that you do have the knife why do you have that one and how do you use it uh i, I use it to cut boxes and and use the toothpick feature that's pretty much that's pretty much it i i never know when i when i need a knife you know, so I've I've carried it for gosh as long as I can remember, just because it's it's like it's always goes in my pocket, my money clip, and my knife, because I you know always need something at work or at home. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an actual knife user, yeah. not a knife guy, not but an knife, actual not a knife junkie yet, and not a yet. Yes, he will be soon. You can you can guarantee you can take that to the bank. So Jim does a lot of stuff in his extracurricular life where he's buying and selling antiques and other goods. And uh, so he's I noticed we worked together, and I always noticed that he was talking about uh, antique stuff and and going to state sales and getting some awesome deals. Right. And I asked him how he was opening up his boxes. He showed me that knife, right? And that's where this <laughs> came from. Yeah. Well, speaking of buying selling, you know, you mentioned we work together. We both have full time jobs. Uh, you know, I'm a side hustler, so I do uh, sell online. Line on uh, Amazon and eBay, and uh, you know, you being the knife junkie, you're my go-to guy for knives because I love making money. So I, I love it when I come across knives at auction, especially online auction, where I can look them up. And I actually send you the pictures and send you the link and say, "Hey, what are these? Are they worth buying? Should I make them?" And I got to tell this story. I uh, in an online auction, I bought and I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. A Parker Cutco Game Getter Stag Handle Folding Knife. And I got it at auction. Fees and everything included for $9.75. Talked to the knife junkie. I said, Bob, thinking about selling this for 40 or 50 Am I in the ballpark? And he, he, he did some research. He came back. Said, I just saw one that sold for 150 I was like, wow, that, that sounds like a lot. Yeah. I was a little nervous about that. So I only listed it for one and a quarter on eBay and actually took an offer for $100. So nice. profit after fees, $74.24. So I'm excited about that. Can't wait to learn more about knives so that I can uh, keep keep flipping knives, as we say. Maybe not collect them, but, but buy and sell them. And when I get those emails and texts from you, hey, is there anything here? You know, can I buy any of this stuff? It actually makes me feel useful. You okay. know, like, like, this, like this crazy obsession is useful. I right. can, I, you know, I'm a resource now. Right. Well, speaking of uh, buying new knives, we have our show structure is going to be that we have a couple of segments in our show, yep. as well as interviews and those kind of things. One of the segments we're going to be featuring today is something called Ships in the Night. Ships which, in the which Night. Which yeah. I think is about getting new knives. Or yeah, well, like the, uh, yes. The idea is um, Ships in the Night. You might not uh, have that knife for long because desire for another knife pops up. So I don't know if uh, anyone else experiences this. I'm sure I'm the only person, but I buy a knife say online from an online retailer, 
and before it even shows up, I'm looking for the next one. And uh, not only am I, not only am I looking for the next one online, but I'm looking at YouTube videos of the um, yet to be delivered knife that I just purchased. Okay. To hear about how great they are, to justify the purchase <laughs> right. in my, in my right. own mind. How smart I am for buying yes, this yes. knife. Boy, it's a good thing because yeah. you know when the apocalypse comes, this is going to have great trading value. Right. You know right. this six hundred dollar hinderer knife. Well, and we mentioned show segments. We were going to try to do two segments each show. Uh, we mentioned ships in the night is going to be coming up. Mm-hmm. We also have a, a maintenance minute segment for this show, which is going to be coming up. But here on uh, show double zero, kind of our intro, yeah. we're going to get into uh, why knives, why another knife podcast. And we've already talked a little bit about who are Jim and Bob, but we're going to go a little further into detail about the knife chunky and kind of mm. kind of get your backstory. Have you ever gotten rid of an old knife just so you could replace it with a new one? So have we. And that's what our ships in the night segment is all about. The Great Eastern Cutlery Number 14, their new run of Lick Creek Boys Knives, are another precedent-setting traditional slip joint jackknife from my favorite traditional manufacturer, Great Eastern Cutlery. This run of the Great Eastern Cutlery Number 14 comes in a variety of covers. Uh, So far, it comes in two blade configurations as well. A single clip, uh, which uh, seems to have been sold out everywhere as soon as it uh, came out, just like the single clip 15s, and a clip main and pen secondary. That's the two-blade configuration. That's the one I just got. Both blades pivot on the same end of the knife, making this a jackknife. And it is a small jackknife indeed, beware. Close the number 14 is 3 inches long, uh, the main clip measuring 2 and 5 sixteenths, and the pen blade acute 1 and 3 quarters inches. Now these are my measurements with a tape measure, uh, and uh, so take that for what you will. The main blade has a stout pull of about 8 and the pen has about a five pole, and both have a half stop, and both have really nice walk and talk. Mine is the Northfield, uh, it's wearing Northfield trim, uh, in antique yellow jig bone, which is my favorite, and nickel silver bolsters. And this one has a nickel silver butt cap, unlike other 14s I've seen in the past, and 15s I've seen for a long time. This clip blade has a gorgeous long pull and machine cut swedge. It's a look I really love, and to me, it, it's reminiscent of something from a different era, whereas the nail nick and hand-drawn swedge, to me, just looks relatively timeless. The serial number on the new number 14s uh, is oddly split on both sides of the pen blade Ricasso, uh, and I, I believe it's because it's just a very diminutive uh, little blade. And on one side, the mark side, it reads 141, and the 14 is the pattern number, 14. The one is the main blade pattern, which is a bowie. That's how they categorize the bowie. And then on the pile side, when you flip it, you have 218. Two standing for the number of blades on this knife, and 18, the year of manufacture. I've had this knife for about a week, and I've used it for legitimately three tasks. Cutting paracord in my shop, sharpening pencils, and opening mail. And uh, those are all obviously very light tasks, but this is a slip joint. And uh, it did fine at all those things until I put my edge on it. And now these little blades are so thin and slicey and amazing. They're like, it's like a pocket scalpel. I'm going to be uh, using the main blade, which has already developed a patina for food, and the small pen blade for sharpening pencils, etc. Anyway, in conclusion, the fit and finish are typical GEC great. And if you like smaller slip joints, which I do, and we're talking case sway back size, you will love this knife and you will not be disappointed with it. So uh, there you go. That's the Great Eastern Cutlery Number 14 Lick Creek Boys Knife. How'd you like that upgrade on Ships in the Night? Now here's more of the Knife Junkie Podcast. All right, so you've got your new GEC 14, cool little knife oh, there. she's a honey. Yeah, she's yeah, a little honey. Yeah. All right. So this is a great excuse for you to have to buy more knives for our Ships in the Night segment. Well, oh, geez, you know, Jim, I <laughs> hadn't thought of that, really. <laughs> honey, so, it's for the future. That's right. It's a, it's a business expense. Speaking about this, we are doing this uh, for fun. It's, it's, it's uh, Bob's passion. Uh, Bob is the knife junkie. How did you get that passion, though, Bob? I really want to kind of get our listeners to uh, kind of understand who you are and why this passion for knives, why you like them, why you yeah. like to ke- collect them, and, and again, why this podcast about knives? I mean, why, why add another podcast out there? There's already several. Yeah, well, um, from my perspective, I have a lot to add, Jim. I've been obsessed with knives for the better part of 47 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it's just part of who I am. I love listening to podcasts and, uh, I figured this is a great time to get out there in the knife industry and start talking because people love it. Right. But why knives? Why obsessed with knives for so long? 
it's like a tool. You never hear of people being obsessed with wrenches mm -hmm. or saw blades. I mean, maybe there are some people, but yeah. there's not a saw blade wrench community out there. <laughs> I think uh, growing up in the 70s, when you're watching TV, when you're watching movies, it was like every man, if you were a man, you had a knife on your belt. You know, you got the father on Land of the Lost. You got Daniel Boone. You got Grizzly Adams. You know, all these guys walking around with knives. And that's the stuff I was consuming and running around the woods right. and, and that kind of thing. Right. And uh, so I think it was this idea that men wore knives, right. you know. And then shortly after that, it's the idea that men know how to fight with them. Uh -huh. Knives and swords. Right. And, you know, get game for the ladies and, and that kind of thing. And my brother, when I was real little, had a toy knife that I obsessed over and that he would not let me play with. Uh -huh. I, I think it goes back to that. Yeah. yeah. So that was your, that was your first kind of memory of, of knives and yep. kind of lusting after them? Well, yeah. My grandfather was a maker of everything. He could make mm. anything. And he always had knives in his pockets, little slip joints like that GEC, but he didn't pay 100 bucks for it. That's for damn right. sure. Right. And uh, so seeing him always working with the knife, I hear a lot of people talk about grandpa knives and mm -hmm. getting it from their grandfathers. But he also made a knife for my older brother, I remember, and I was okay. insanely envious of it. Right. Not only was I jealous, but I didn't want my brother to have it. If I couldn't have it, he shouldn't have right. it. And my grandfather never made the knife for me when I got older. Oh. He said, someday, Bob, when you're older. Right. Some days never came, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a family thing. Yeah. And my, you, you, you remember know, how old you were? I must have been five or six. Wow. Yeah, my wow. brother was about ten when that knife wow. was so made. So uh, it's, it's like truly been your whole life, I mean, really. Uh, yes, yes, most definitely. And then I got a, a, a trickle from my grandfather of pocket knives that he was done with. Oh, cool. That were old and dull and that I would bring back to life. And, um, you know, incidentally, my dad had a sword that was a, it was a bring back from the Philippines that he had bought at a flea market. Hmm. Some GI brought back a Filipino sword. And uh, it looks a lot like this one I pulled out before. Right. And. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, he'd let us see it. And that was a big thing. Oh, oh Dad's bringing down the sword. Let's go oh, check oh. it out. What was it What was it about the knife? I mean, was it the, like, well, you kind of talked about, you know, the manly man always carried mm -hmm. a knife. But, I mean, was it like, you know, you described some of these things in your pocket, you know. Was it the look of the knife? Was it the shiny steel? Was it kind of the way it felt in your hand? I mean, can you describe I think, that? I think a lot of it has to do with aesthetics. Hmm. You know, I've always been an artist, and I think I was drawn in by the imagery of the knife mm. early on. But also the the idea that when you have a knife, you are suddenly much more capable of doing so many more things than you are when you don't have it. And it's a simple tool. Mm. It's the first tool. Right. Um, so I think uh, the idea of being self-reliant, the idea of having some menace, not that I'm a bad guy, but mm. if a bad guy comes along, I want to be able to take care of myself. Got something to protect yourself, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I think it just goes back to some, yeah, some masculine fantasizing right, right, right. <laughs> from earlier. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, the knife is the first tool, and actually we have that's one of the segments of our show. Mm -hmm. Not going to be on this uh, show today, but I think it's uh, I think episode two. I think we have uh, the first tool coming up. Explain a little bit. Let's kind of veer off course of, from some of your background, but some of the show segments that we're going to be having. You know, we've got ships in the night this uh, this episode, maintenance minute. You know, obviously learning about maintenance tips, those kind of things. But we also have tip, walk and talk, tip of the week, the first tool, yep. uh, knife news. So explain a little bit about those. Well, I I think it's important to have these little segments because um, during certain times of year, companies drop their products. Or uh, when knife shows are coming up or in the offing, you want to start talking about products that are coming out that people are excited about. And that makes a good one-minute segment. But every single week, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's an exciting thing to do. So when exciting products are coming out, we'll talk about them. Okay. Like the Emerson Deep Carry Pocket Clip, which is exciting to me as an Emerson fan. Um, but also, Ships in the Night, it's important to talk about collecting as a hobby. Mm -hmm. Knives come, knives go. Right. Your ideas shift, your tastes shift. Right. Uh, for for instance, recently I've been in a I've been in a slip joint phase, and and I was almost to the point where I was ready to sell everything else to get more slip joints, and then right. I realized, Bob, you've been here before. Right. Calm down. <laughs> Don't throw away the rest of your knives. Right. Well, that, that that's an interesting question that I was going to ask you. Why collect knives? I guess that's a dumb question because you've you've got this passion. You've you've been around them for all your because life. Because variety but, is the spice of yeah, life, Jim. Yeah, <laughs> you never have too many knives. I thank, guess. thank, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank God I'm not a gun guy. I'd be <laughs> out. Of, I'd be out on the street. So I think you asked why collect knives. I think it is the variety. For instance, with traditional slip joint knives, 
the variety, yes, is in the blades and the blade configuration, but where people really get off is on the covers, the cover materials. Mm. Jig bones and yeah. micartas and stags and natural materials, woods and stuff. People really get into, like my little GEC collection is starting to show a, a strain of antique yellow jig bone. I just love it. Hmm. It reminds me of my grandfather's right. knives. Okay, so. okay. Yeah, bring back, bring back some memories, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned a knife as from my use, you know, opening a box here and there, the toothpick feature, etc. But knives can also be considered weapons. So, I mean, kind of talk about that difference, I guess, if you will. Most definitely. I I, uh, I see a disconcerting trend in, in uh, video knife reviews, people online that I love. I love all of these reviewers. But I sometimes hear this uh, disparaging attitude of the knife as self-defense, backup self-defense weapon. Hmm. And to me, it, it only seems obvious that it would fill that role. Uh, and not every knife. There are knives that are built for that purpose, but okay. you get a lot of this attitude, well, in the, in the age of the gun, how could you possibly think of the knife as a weapon, you fool? I'll just gun you down. Well, th that's not the point. The point is, you know, you have levels of security, mm -hmm. you know, and you have levels of aggression, and, and uh, if your gun is out of bullets... If someone's on top of you, I don't know what the scenarios right, are. Right. Okay, so I, I've been doing a Filipino Kali since the late 90s. It's all based in knives and sticks and machetes. And there are endless drills to perfect your, um, your ability to do these techniques. Hmm. But in reality, there are only a few very, very basic techniques your body is going to be able to do mm -hmm. when you're uh, in caveman mode. And, and you're only able to, to use gross motor um, skills. Because, well, unless you're a hardened combatant, and right. I am not. Right. But I think that it's important to recognize that, yes, most likely the tool in your pocket, the, the knife in your pocket, is going to be used to cut threads, errant threads off your shirt and open mail and that kind of thing. Right. Or, or put on a shelf just to look at it yeah. in your collection. And fondle. But, but really, I mean, to think of it as also an extension of your own body is mm -hmm. as a weapon is right. totally legit. Right. You mentioned kind of this transition, a uh, young boy, four or five years old, seeing the first knife, loving it, you know, uh, starting collecting knives. You're into Filipino, what did you Martial call? arts, it's Martial called Kali. Kali. Yeah. Kali. okay, okay. So kind of that transition there, but you're also a knife maker. Yes, I am. Well, I've, I've, uh, I've always been an artist, and I went to art school and did all that. And I've been working in media for 20 years almost. Um, but working with my hands has always been my first love. And a few years ago, I was inspired by watching a guy whose name, I'm sorry, I can't remember. He was a British guy living in Canada, in a very cold part of Canada, mm -hmm. making knives with a simple file on his balcony in the winter. And I'm like, this dude can go out and brave the Canadian winter on his porch with a file and, and, and file away at metal and make knives and sell them because he was selling them too. Wow. Warthorn, I think, was the, was the model of the knife. If this guy can do it, I, you know, I can do it. And, and I don't live in Canada, and I can right. probably get a machine. So... <laughs> So why don't I start? Right. So that's what I did. So how, how many knives would you say you've made? To date, uh, I'm very slow, Jim. I'm I'm slow in plotting. But uh, to date, I'd say I've made about 20. Okay. 20 okay. or so. All right. Well, that's a good start. Many of them I've given away as gifts. Oh, okay. A few of them I just hold on to and right. carry. Right. So a kind of a twofold question. Somebody's come across our, our intro show, yeah. Double Zero. Yeah. You know? um, what would you hope they take away, and what is the audience that you're, you're trying to reach with this podcast? Well, I'm, I want to reach everyone who likes to sit down in front of YouTube and go down that hole and watch YouTube videos. This is for those kind of people, people who love to talk about knives. Um, because it's an area of interest. But I want to sometimes speak to knives as a tool and different ways we can use them as tools. I want to talk about martial arts and different ways knives can be used as weapons. Mm -hmm. But I also want to talk about them as objects of collection and, and interest. Mm -hmm. So everyone from the brand new to knives person, which is me, which is you, We'll get a lot from our maintenance minutes, which talk about things like carbon steel and stainless steel. Very basic to a regular knife guy. But someone who might be new to knives and is kind of curious and doesn't want to ask, there you go. Right. Okay. Well, interesting you mentioned that. Uh, carbon versus stainless is on our upcoming maintenance minute segment. We'll have more of the Knife Junkie podcast coming up in just a minute. But don't forget the uh, Knife Junkie is on YouTube. And you can find him at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Bob and Jim will have more of the Knife Junkie podcast in just a minute. But now, here's this week's Maintenance Minute. 
High Carbon Steel versus Stainless Steel. Now, most of your modern tactical style folding knives and readily available fixed blades, I mean readily at uh, national retailers, are made from a variety of stainless steels. They're made from stainless steels because stainless steel is easy to maintain, and uh, you're less apt to throw away a rusty blade uh, when you're a non-knife guy and your knife rusts. The main benefit of stainless steel is the higher chromium content, and that results in high levels of corrosion resistance. It's going to be much harder to rust, in other words, and that makes it easy to maintain. Some of the higher-end stainless steels feature beyond belief edge retention, and that comes at the expense of toughness. Now, what does toughness mean? When we're talking about blade steels, toughness is the ability for a steel to take impact without chipping out or edge rolling or shattering. High carbon steels have toughness in spades, and that's why you often find it on outdoor fixed blades. Uh, knives you're going to be using on the trail or around the campsite. You're going to be swinging it. The blades are going to be taking impact. You need toughness. That's what high carbon steel gives you. But you sac sacrifice edge retention and uh, corrosion resistance. So that is its main Achilles heel, rust. So if you determine you're working with a high carbon steel, be sure to thoroughly clean it. Clean the blade when you're finished. You can use soapy water or alcohol. Just make sure it's dry and then apply a generous amount of oil. It could be mineral oil. It could be three-in-one. It could be one of these expensive uh, branded knife oils. It could even be WD-40. The, the idea is just to create a coat on the blade that will resist uh, rust and never leave it in the sheath. The idea is just to coat the blade with a layer of oil that will not go rancid, like food oil or uh, like olive oil or vegetable oil. Just make sure it's non-food based oil. And don't leave it in the sheath if you can. So in conclusion, you have to determine whether you're dealing with high carbon steel or stainless steel to properly maintain your knife so that you have it uh, to use for a long time. Uh, one way to check is look at the ricasso of the blade. That's the base of the blade, the unsharpened portion. Oftentimes, you'll see steel designated there. Read it, punch it into your search engine, find out whether it's stainless steel or high carbon steel. If it's high carbon steel, wash it, dry it, oil it. You're done. If it's stainless steel, clean it, dry it, and keep it in a dry place. You want to make sure that you maintain your knives properly so that they will always be there for you. That's this week's Maintenance Minute, and now more of the Knife Junkie podcast. All right, well, it was a knife newbie. That was definitely uh, some good information there, Bob, on the uh, Maintenance Minute, about, at least for me, just being able to try to figure out what kind of what kind of steel is on this little blade here I've got. <laughs> so, it's good. funny you say that about Victorinox. People have been trying to figure that out for years. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, I have to learn more about that. We've also got uh, some other cool segments coming up in, in future shows. One of them is uh, Walk and Talk. Walk and Talk, where yes. You, where we have a sound of a knife that uh, we're going to ask people to call in and try to try to figure yeah, out what that knife is. That's right. Identify it by the sound it makes opening and closing. Yeah. That's coming up on an upcoming show, but I do want to go ahead and mention the listener line, 724-466-4487. That's the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line. Again, 724-466-4487. And we want to ask you a question. Since we are uh, starting this podcast in November of the, the holiday season, we have a, a simple question. We'd love to get your responses back by the end of November 2018, November 30th, 2018. Simple question, what knife do you want for Christmas? or Hanukkah, or whatever other religious celebration you say. We'll say, what kind of knife do you want for the holiday? Yeah, what's your holiday knife? Yeah, what do you really want? Maybe it'll be a good opportunity to uh, uh, leave that uh, on the uh, listener line, and then if we do use your answer, you can play it back for your spouse or, you know, fiancé or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever and say, hey, you know, just dropping some hints here. Yeah. Check me out. I'm famous now. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But uh, that is what we uh, plan to do here on the Knife Chunky podcast and with the listener line. If you have any questions at any time, please call that number, 724-466-4487. Uh, leave your name. Uh, if you have a website, if you have a YouTube channel, go ahead and plug that. Any kind of question or comment you have, and uh, you may hear that uh, on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Bob, wow, time has flown, man. we gotta, we got to kind of wrap this one up, but some good information on the show today. I yeah, think. I think so. I think so. Are you a knife junkie yet? Are you? Uh, I'm, I'm not there yet, no. but I'm, I'm going further toward the scale. Of, a budding knife guy. A budding knife guy. I really can, I really can see myself. I, I think it, again, will be more for me of a buy and sell kind of passion. Mm -hmm. But I really think the more educated I can become just about the, the types of knives. I mean, I, I really, you know, yeah. I didn't 
no, there's so many types of knives. Oh, oh, there's so oh, many yeah. brands of knives. <laughs> you know, there's so many those type of things. So I think the more I can learn, the better off I'll be in my, my side hustle buying and selling. Yeah. And, and who knows, maybe I'll uh, pick up one or two just to keep and put it on the shelf or whatever and look at it. We'll yeah, see. Just a little, a little something nice in the pocket. We'll see. The Knife Junkie Podcast, I uh, want to thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget to visit us at thenifejunkie.com. You can find links there for all of our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. And again, the listener line is 724-466-4487. Bob, last word from the Knife Junkie. Sharp. Ooh, that's a good word. All right. <laughs> Thanks Take for care. listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.